Hey everyone, Crisis here. There is a new topic that needs to be addressed regarding the latest release of the Spider-Man video game. The second one. I mean, third, or whatever. See, every time any piece of Spider-Man media comes out without failure, a contingent of fans will deem the new webhead as the strongest one yet. However, seeing as in Spider-Man 2, you fight Sandman, get the black suit, fight Lizard, Kraven, and face Venom, I see it most appropriate to pit Insomniac Spidey against the original cinematic webhead who did technically the same thing. We'll be assessing who would win between Spider-Man from the three Sam Raimi films and No Way Home versus Insomniac Spider-Man as seen in the so far three game long saga. To clarify, we will be considering their feats performed by each of their base forms, symbiote-empowered states, and in Insom's case, his anti-venom form which he sports at the end of Spider-Man 2, the fifth one. Final wall to stick to and get ready as we break down each of their attack powers, durability, combat speed, and special abilities to see who would win. Being a massive fan of both iterations of the character, it's fair to say these two are my personal favorites outside of the Ultimate Comics and maybe the 90s show. Given that, I've seen and been a part of much debate already. A fallacy I've seen many people commit is comparing their respective heroes' performances against their respective villains, acting like this Doc Ock must be just as strong as this Doc Ock, for example. Obviously, this kind of defeats the purpose of the thought experiment in the first place, since by that logic every Spider-Man is just equal as fighters across the board when I think we all know that's not true. While yes, Insomniac's fights against his Sinister Six are impressive, we should all know that there are many versions of Spider-Man with feats that far eclipse those versions of the rogues combined. For example, Spider-Man from Ultimate Alliance canonically fought against the universal power of Odin channeled through Doctor Doom, and each Spider-Man from Shattered Dimensions beat up Mysterio, who was a threat to the entire multiverse. But I guess because Game Toby one-shot his Mysterio, it means he scales above that. I think I made my point. There's a precedent for certain versions of every fictional character to far surpass another to where it's not even funny. So with that said, let's actually begin to judge each wall crawler based on their merits. As stated in my various other videos covering Insomniac Spider-Man's power level, Electro in the first game barreled through and shattered a smokestack, with Spidey tanking this and then beating Electro in a 1v2. Keep in mind that Spider-Man was also injured here with multiple broken bones. This feat has been calculated to yield energy nearly equal to 4 tons of TNT, or enough force to destroy an entire large building, which this version of Spider-Man would be able to endure with relative ease. However, in the Miles Morales game, the second Spider-Man was able to to absorb and endure levels of energy which would have vaporized all of the New York Bureau of Harlem. This time with standing up to 485 kilotons of TNT, about 120,000 times more powerful than Electro's feet. Skeptics have made the argument that due to Miles' ability to absorb energy, he'd be more so doing that than outright tanking this level of power. My rebuttal to that would be the fact that this clearly isn't an easy thing for Miles, and it is causing him great pain. If he just diffused it all without a sweat, then maybe I could agree. Obviously, this energy has an adverse effect on him, yet he ultimately withstands it all the same. In the past, I'd say that based on this, that Miles far outclasses Peter in this universe. But seeing as Symbiote Spider-Man was able to clash with an even stronger Miles, stated to have evolved Venom Blast abilities, he too would at least be able to endure roughly the same levels of force. And by the time of the second game, Miles is able to crystallize chunks of the massive Sandman, which would land at about 750 tons of TNT or multi-city block level, with even base Peter's iron spider arms at least having the durability to channel Miles' venom blast, meaning his arms would, at worst, be able to act as a shield and protect Peter from forces of this scale. Just prior to his fight with Kraven, the hunter trapped symbiote Spidey in a container, which he was informed to be unbreakable, with Peter enraged at the sight of a wounded Miles, pulling it apart at the seams. Out of context, I could see the argument for this case having city levels of durability, if it is truly unbreakable and would therefore be able to endure the near 50 megaton superweapons of our real world. However, given the context that Kraven's quest is to capture and fight New York's superhumans, not endure a nuclear war, I think it's safe to say that that's not what this off-screen procurer of containers meant by the term unbreakable. It's kind of like the term unbeatable. Are we supposed to believe that whoever says that in any piece of fiction is considering literal beyond god-like levels of power, or rather the context wherein the 
statement was made. This is, however, good evidence for an enraged black suit Spider-Man, scaling above any feat thus seen so far in the Insomniac verse, such as Miles's and Sandman's displays, with Marco generating roughly town levels of energy throughout his storm creation feats. And for further insight, Venom at the end of Spider-Man 2, via very quickly lifting chunks of a high school football field, as well as a gymnasium with his tendrils, generating force near 13 tons of TNT, or energy capable of annihilating an entire city block. Multiple calculations based on this, as well as other similar fictional displays, land this at around city block as well. This on paper is weaker than Miles' feet against Sandman, which in turn is weaker than Miles' feet at the end of his own game, true, but Venom displays superiority over Miles regardless. Whether or not Peter, empowered by either a symbiote or anti-Venom, scales to this in reality, I'm skeptical. Seeing as Sandman required both Spider-Man to combine their power to win, and the fact that Venom with his tendrils was bullying Peter, knocked him out, and only lost pretty much due to the fact that Harry Osborn was fighting the alien's control over him. And on top of that, anti-Venom is symbiote kryptonite. It's not that he's more powerful than any of them necessarily. He does get pretty much bullied by Venom in terms of actual strength on screen. And to anyone who might bring it up, Venom would only be capable of coating the world in goop if he channeled the full power of the meteor. It was a vision of a doomsday scenario that never happened, and surely would have been the end for both Spider-Men anyway, y'all calm down. Still, just know that for now, Black Suit Spider-Man surely scales to multi-city block, or even possibly large town levels of power, as he was able to combat Miles while they were each fatigued. In terms of speed, just based on the games alone, not much has changed in the case of Insomniac Spidey. He was able to dodge Electro's attacks all throughout the first game, with those being referred to as Lightning Blasts, which travel at around massively hypersonic speeds. While many beam weapons are seen in the games, Fiction boasts many such attacks that would be far slower than the actual speed of light lasers of the real world. Plasma beams, as an example, don't even scrape near the speed of light, and none of the weapons that this Spidey dodges are ever specifically called lasers. So, massively hypersonic is still the cap for this wall crawler without making too many assumptions. As far as skills and abilities, Insom boasts the standard kit for Spider-Man, precog, webs, superhuman agility, acrobatic fighting style he picked up from movies, and the like. By the time of Spider-Man 2, his tech is a bit stripped down compared to his first outing. He currently wields a concussive blast, a gadget to stun and launch enemies in the air, a web grabber to pull opponents all into one location, further launching nearby objects into them, and ricochet webs. With his symbiote, he can make the use of tendrils, and as anti-venom, he can burn away symbiotes, basically becoming their kryptonite. Toby, Toby, Toby. What left is there to say? Just in the first movie alone, while fatigued from performing his max lift at the time, and after being wailed on by Goblin, this Peter was able to withstand a pumpkin bomb to the face and then becomes so enraged to the point that he just walked it off. Using the calculation derived from these same bombs prior displays of instantly skeletonizing and dustifying six grown adults, a fatigued Toby would already be capable of tanking 40 tons of TNT or city block levels by the end of his first film alone. This is consistent with the power of Goblin's Glider's missiles, with their detonations yielding nearly 80 tons of TNT, still city block level. Keep in mind that while Osborne never exactly hit Toby with these missiles, he himself thinks that they wouldn't get the job done, as he called Spider-Man all but invincible. With his plan therefore becoming one of crushing his spirit and taking him down, as he would become gripped with loss. Keep in mind too that Peter too gets stronger all throughout his movies, with the official novel overseen by Sony Pictures stating that he retained all of his power and then some after becoming Spider-Man again after Ock kidnapped MJ. With the villains in Spider-Man 3 each called his greatest foes yet, such as Sandman who in his fight with Spidey was able to generate earthquakes felt all throughout New York's subway system. This is shown on a byline in the Daily Bugle, the day following the clash between Parker and Marco. So it's pretty clear these quakes were a result of their bout. Taking this at face value, which I think is fair to do as clearly JJ hates reporting on fake news, Black Suit Spidey would be able to generate forces nearly equal to 390 tons of TNT or multi-city block level. This is what it would take to generate such seismic energy as the event was felt enough to be placed on the front page while nothing was necessarily destroyed. Meaning that this would likely fall on a class three in the 
the earthquake magnitude scale. Peter in his base form was then able to damage a giant and therefore stronger Sandman, surviving many of his overhead strikes without even blocking out, then managing to get up a few seconds after eventually being KO'd, immediately kicking and busting apart this same massive Sandman fist. And he even goes on to clash with his Venom, with the two stated to wield unparalleled power. So similar to how he became more powerful after putting the red and blues back on in Spider-Man 2, that happened here. With a fatigued, broken rib Toby scaling to a greater than multi-city block Sandman, someone who could clash with the symbiote-empowered version of himself earlier in the movie. And evidently, this version of Spider-Man would not stop growing, as within No Way Home, he'd find himself firmly scaling to many of the Marvel Cinematic Universe's strongest displays of strength. Tom Holland's version of Spider-Man boasts his own incredible growth in power. After being officially stated to have unlocked his true strength after digging deep within himself in Homecoming, Peter One was immediately able to hold strikes from Cole Obsidian, a powerful emissary of Thanos, capable of breaking apart and denting the Hulkbuster Mark II. With the Mark I able to clash with an enraged Hulk who could draw blood from Thor and should be the strongest Avenger by the time of Phase 2. The Raimiverse version of Goblin with his bare, unarmored face, which was never stated to have gotten stronger from being in the MCU, was able to tank and fodderize MCU Spidey in their initial fight. I have other videos detailing how Toby is the strongest live-action Spider-Man, but that's not even necessary here. Whether or not you think Tom is holding back against Goblin, he likely would to an even greater degree against Cull Obsidian, seeing as, unlike against Goblin, his family was not in immediate danger there. So Toby would scale to the Hulkbuster and earlier, less powerful versions of Thor and Hulk regardless, as crazy as that sounds. So Toby, after decades worth of his powers evolving, would be able to endure forces such as Iron Man's city-level laser as seen in Iron Man 2, which was outdone by both Thor and Hulk as early as Phase 1. Or even things like Thor shaking an entire ice planet in his first movie, which would yield around 700 teratons of TNT, or enough energy to destroy a large country. I'm not saying that Toby could destroy a country with a single punch, just that he would survive attacks boasting similar amounts of of energy that would be required to do so based on the MCU's power scaling. In the case of speed, Toby 2 dodges lightning and as well outperforms Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man, who does the same all throughout his second movie. The MCU cast as well boasts a higher speed meta, with Iron Man shooting particle beams or Carol Danvers shooting photon blasts, with various scaling chains leading back to the MCU Spidey and therefore Peter 2, landing his reaction speeds, or what he should be able to dodge, being anywhere from massively hypersonic to near the speed of light. His powers include precognition, unlimited webs, he can create web bullets, nets, tripwires, and shields, he adapts to his opponent's weaknesses on the fly, he can fight against geniuses wielding high-tech arsenals, he was even stated by the first film's VFX supervisor to have all the capabilities of the main comic Spider-Man, which is clearly pretty insane. With the black suit, he should benefit from a pretty robust healing factor, albeit weak to sound. So with all of their stats and abilities laid out, how would this battle between symbiote and powered Spider-Man go down? Based on just the Spider-Man 1, 2, and 3 films alone, Insomniac would actually be more powerful, scaling to either Miles' feet at the end of his game, or his displays against Sandman at the start of the second game. It's multi-city block at best for Black Suit, or end of Spider-Man 3 Toby, versus multi-city block to large town level Yuri, in the form of either his Iron Spider Arms durability, or via his symbiote suit's attack potency, meaning he'd be about 1,250 times stronger than any any calculable feat throughout the Raimi trilogy. However, considering Toby's feats in No Way Home and the fact that Peter 2 grew stronger throughout each of his movies and would logically continue to do so, even being abysmally conservative, Toby would scale to Phase 1 Iron Man, with the energy his laser could output being at least over 6 times Miles' Harlem feat when calculated by Versus Battle Wiki and still nearly 10 megatons more than the same display when assessed by game theory. Remember that in the first Avengers movie, the same laser would have run out of power before it even began to cut into a Leviathan's hull, with Hulk and Thor later doing just that through their strikes alone. So Hulk, and therefore the Hulk Buster, and therefore Cull Obsidian, would be able to output excess of these forces, and MCU Spidey tanked Cole's attacks, who Raimiverse characters scale to point blank. Cole was even able to walk off a strike from Mjolnir-amped Captain America. Food for thought. 
Even given the anti-venom suit, while it should be able to purge the alien from Toby's system if he were to manage to put his paws on a possessed Peter 2 long enough, what happens from then on would be pretty obvious. Toby's ability to instantly recover is insane, and while anti-venom should represent Insom at his strongest, the best feat he'd scale to is still nowhere near Toby's weight class, even ignoring the crazy stuff like Phase 2 Thor busting Sokovia or shaking a planet in Phase 1. As far as abilities, Yuri does have better tech for sure. Sure, but when it comes to web variations, Toby should still have him beat. Even ignoring all the crazy stuff 616 Peter can pull off, which Peter 2 is implied to be capable of, Toby has also dealt with both symbiotes and people possessing similar power sets to himself, and has always come out on top. For those who act like all the villains should just equal each other, Toby beat his Venom, but uh, yeah. He's also way more experienced with many more years of crime fighting and even multiversal shenanigans. On that note, I really don't want to bog you guys down with all this talk of canon, but I have to address the various comic tie-ins and battles that Insomniac Spidey has allegedly undergone. Spider-Man 2 The Game made it very clear that the main version of this Spider-Man is connected to the Across the Spider-Verse multiverse, which is then connected to the MCU's Sacred Timeline, with the Marvel Cinematic Universe featuring many, many comic contradictions, separating it from the conventional comic multiverse, such as the fact that Spider-Verse shows us its own versions of Earth-65, 1610, 616, and so on, that are clearly radically different from the comics. If it were connected, where was main continuity Peter during Miguel's shenanigans? Where was the real Miguel? So on and so forth. This paired with the fact that the three Insomniac games themselves never reference Spider-Geddon or Spider-Man Unlimited Infinity, and as they are the main source material in this case, that in instead reference the Spider-Verse movies, with Peter not even knowing about the multiverse in the game, when based on the comics he very well should. He doesn't even recognize these bots that are based on Spider-Man he's supposed to have already met, and he never brings up the multiverse as a possible origin for said bots. Plus, the writer for Insom's comic appearances stated that he didn't even know if the books were canon to the games. Evidently, they are not. It's confusing and requires a lot of knowledge about random MCU and Marvel comic lore, but it seems like Spider-Geddon and Spider-Man Unlimited Infinity are not canon to the games. To put it in simple terms, certain Insomniac writers may have intended for the comics to be canon, but based on their own inclusions of Across the Spider-Verse lore, within the primary source material itself, the game in this case, their intent is overruled by the previously established lore of the MCU, which clashes more times than not with the mechanics of the comics multiverse. Essentially, they goofed. In the same way that Spider-Verse and the MCU can have their own Earth 65s and 616s, similar to but distinct from the comics, so too can the comic multiverse have its own Earth 1048. Even still, all he does in those books is kick an embarrassingly weakened form of superior Spider-Man once, and he tanks it on top of that. A version of Otto that doesn't even scale to actual Doc Ock, who 616 Peter could bully whenever he wants, and he fights 616 Peter, who is pretty clearly holding back, trying to talk down his counterpart who aided him in the past, as opposed to PS4 Spidey who is fighting so that a villain can revive Uncle Ben and Aunt May. In fact, recently, Comic Peter was stated to be holding back so much that he even does it unconsciously, with Peter's power depending on how hard he's trying or how motivated he is, which based on the context of this issue wouldn't be very hard at all. Even if it were canon, Insom scaling to 616 is a myth. Even at face value, Toby himself has been stated to have all the abilities of 616 Spider-Man in his first movie, if we want to play that game. So, when everything is said and done, if you ignore the events of No Way Home, Insomniac Spider-Man actually boasts greater striking power and durability than his Raimiverse counterpart. But when accounting for the entirety of Peter 2's canon history, his contending with beings brushing shoulders with some of the strongest powerhouses in the MCU would make him too durable and swift for his playable opponent. Toby would as well be too fast to tag, experienced enough to deal with Insom's tech, having fought other Spider-Men and symbiotes already. And since some people keep resorting to lifting feats to determine who would win for some reason, UFC is not a powerlifting competition after all. Remember my explanations from prior videos detailing how Toby halted and lifted a wall, being pulled by the force of essentially a small star. More than a Ferris wheel, for sure, even with one hand. Spidey in the comics has managed to impress Thor and Hulk with his lifting strength, and was compared to them in this capacity in classic Marvel. So Toby showcasing this level 
level of strength when motivated to his utmost to save Mary Jane is justified and comic accurate. With Symbiote Spider-Man being stated to be stronger than ever, and Base Spider-Man by the end of Spider-Man 3 clearly being as powerful if not just stronger than that Black Suit Spider-Man earlier in the movie overall. Being generous and saying that Symbiote Insomniac has greater than nuke level strength, by the same logic, so would Raimi Venom and Sandman, with that level of power still being dwarfed by Toby via Cole Obsidian's feats and scaling. In summary, Insomniac Peter has for sure been upgraded to the top of B on my list, but until he finds a way to scrap with actual city level characters or beyond, he has a ways to go. Maybe if Noel shows up and actually coats the world in a symbiote and Peter boxes with him, but until then, Thanks for watching, check out my many other Spider-Man and comic book videos, and I'll see you all next time.